Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for coming this morning. Really looking forward to. We have a very packed schedule through uh, through twelve thirty with some I think really interesting uh, presentations and speakers. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner last night, uh, and I just want to announce that Dr. Curtis, Dr. Curtis, if you could stand up for a moment, he was the uh, selectee for our first ever tribute award. And for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to be at the dinner, he's been um, probably the person who's been to more of these than maybe Scott Silliman, who might be the only other one. Bill Banks is starting to get up there, but uh, uh, he's been a longtime sur uh, supporter of, of Lens, but also uh, my personal mentor for many years, going back uh, several decades. And um, a really, really great. He, he says he's retired, retired now after 21 years in the Air Force and, what, 26 years at the Naval Academy or 24? I have to ask Mary. Mary, how many years is it at, at the Academy? Okay, so we're talking 47 years of, of public service. Uh, and before I, I start talking about all the wonderful things about our speaker this morning, uh, we hear a lot about the other services, but uh, the Admiral, the Co Admiral Anderson is still here from the Coast Guard, and it's kind of hard to get Coast Guard recruiting materials, but we have a little bit of it here. <laughs> well, you figure if they're only hiring, what, 10 or 15 a year, you don't have, hard to justify spending that much, but, but there is some information here, and if, and he's still around, so any of the law students in the area, Please uh, check in with them. And Susan, we're going to make sure you get one of those brochures. <laughs> really privileged to have uh, Glenn Gerstel here as our speaker, the general counsel of the NSA. Uh, his background is very interesting, and I'm hoping I'm going to quiz him at the Q&A um, because I want to hear about not only, of course, things going on at the NSA, but also a very interesting career path. He graduated from Columbia Law School, and we're trying to get over that down here. But, uh, but he uh, spent 40 years uh, with one of the largest law firms, international law law firms, uh, before going to government. I think that's a very interesting career path, and, and we do want to hear more about that. His bio is in our materials. I don't want to take up any more of the time. But I encourage you to take a look at the bio. It's very impressive. And I think it's wonderful to see somebody, uh, probably one of the toughest legal jobs in government, uh, I might suggest, who would come from a very lucrative private law firm position to serve his country in, at the NSA. Glenn? Oops. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Charlie, for not only the introduction, but more importantly, uh, inviting me to uh, be here at this very impressive conference. It's for me. It's uh, uh, you mentioned Columbia, but uh, but I've I've been back at Duke many times because I've had the real privilege of recruiting on many occasions from my old law firm uh, here, and always always with great results. And uh, also had the fun of attending a wedding of a good friend at the Duke University Chapel. And uh, back at NSA, uh, we have two fabulous members of the Duke class of 2012 who are at the Office of General Counsel. And I think this fall we're getting another one. So really great success record. So yesterday, uh, you heard from many experts on the field of uh, cybersecurity, which certainly is a very timely topic for this conference. Right now, that topic is at the forefront of American minds. There's been a pro uh, excuse me, there's been a proliferation of high-profile intrusions against U.S. companies, and malicious cyber activity will forever be associated with the 2016 election cycle. While I can't say I have the same qualifications as many of yesterday's exceptional speakers, uh, I would like to talk to you today from my, the vantage point of my uh, uh, many, many years in the private sector, especially representing companies in the telecom and technology sector. And, uh, and more importantly, also from my service in the last, my position for the last uh, year and a half as the general counsel at NSA. 
Now, many of you may be wondering why the general counsel of the NSA is speaking to it all. After, after all, for the first several decades of its existence, its very existence was denied by the government, and uh, indeed there was no question that anyone would come and talk publicly on, on its behalf. Fortunately, that's all changed, and uh, uh, I suppose you might say, well, then, why aren't you talking about surveillance? After all, after the, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, most people associate the NSA with, with spying. Um, so it's true that foreign surveillance or signals intelligence, to use the more accurate or precise term that we use internally, is only half of our work. Uh, the other half, which is increasingly significant, uh, is information assurance. And information assurance, as you all know, involves pr protecting and perhaps defending information and information systems. Our specific charge in NSA is to protect and defend national security systems which include all classified networks along with those unclassified networks that involve intelligence activities or equipment that's critical to military or intelligence missions. So that includes all of the Department of Defense's networks around the entire world and such specialized uh, communication systems as the President's Nuclear Command uh, Communication System. This latter part of our mission, although uh, I would say somewhat unheralded, is actually of critical importance. So for the next, uh, say, 20 minutes or so, I want to use that platform informed by our, our twin missions to explore some new strategies for the organizational structure that underpins U.S. cybersecurity. So I know that everyone here is a disciple of national security law in one form or another, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the nature of the threat. I think we all know that. Uh, but I'd like to instead talk about how we're currently postured to address that threat, look at some of the gaps that exist, and then spend a few minutes on a couple of uh, some, uh, some ideas on some strategies for how to address that. We all know the nature of the threat. We've heard about it for the last day. We're familiar with it from news reports. But to give some sense of the scope of it, it's no exaggeration to say that cyber vulnerability is probably, or at least arguably, the biggest strategic threat to the United States today. I was alarmed when I had the privilege of sitting in at the first, uh, for, my, for my case, with my first annual threat assessment uh, before closed and, and then later open committees of the uh, House and Senate Intelligence Committees, and I sat right next to the Director of National Intelligence who said, to my surprise, that the biggest strategic threat facing the United States was not terrorism, but was cyber. It was a very meaningful statement. Um, Studies have shown uh, that the malicious cyber activity costs our annual economy an estimated $140 billion a year. And although I don't mean to uh, equate the two, terrorism, again, not, it's not exactly the same, but terrorism is estimated by some studies to cost globally $90 billion, so quite a disparity. And in case you're worried about the stock market bubble, last year the chairman of the SEC said that the gravest threat to the American financial system was cyber. So the threat is so grave, I'm sure you may have heard the comment from uh, Leon Panetta, the former Secretary of Defense, that uh, our cybersecurity weaknesses amount to a pre-9-11 moment. But surely we're doing something about it, right? Well, yeah, true. In, in starting in 2008, the Bush administration took some steps to address cyber, cybersecurity on a national policy. But to be fair, the issue remains somewhat obscure. And indeed, a year later, the topic wasn't even mentioned in President Obama's inaugural address. Over the ensuing eight years, however, as the topic rose in national prominence, the Obama administration took significant steps to implement a whole-of-government approach, you heard some of that from John Carlin yesterday, to dealing with the multifaceted cyber threat, including through the issuance, issuances of some presidential policy directives and executive orders. And in addition to those executive branch efforts, after much debate at the end of 2015, Congress passed the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, or CISA, which is designed to improve cybersecurity by allowing the sharing of information between the public and private sectors. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone believes that CISA by itself is adequate to the task. The statute's slow development was perhaps an indication that at the time CISA was being debated, the full scope of the cyber threat hadn't really sunk in to the, all the parties to the conversation, and also perhaps of the fact that the uh, Snowden disclosures were still then, current, then fairly current in the public memory. <clears throat> in any case, it's still the case today that political will has not yet coalesced around, around one preferred approach, and the U.S. government's approach to cybersecurity remains largely reactive. 
Perhaps that's because, as many critics have noted, cybersecurity roles and responsibilities are unclear. Currently, cybersecurity responsibilities are shared across numerous federal departments, agencies, and, and congressional committees. Uh, to take one example, at NSA, we sort of sit at one end of the, at, of the operational, model, uh, op excuse me, operational model, with NSA being responsible for securing national security systems, as I, as I mentioned before. That means, uh, for example, that NSA is authorized to review and approve all standards, techniques, systems, and equipment related to national security systems. Now contrast that model with the more advisory model that is used to protect the entire .gov domain, which is overseen by the Department of Homeland Security. That department is responsible, at least in principle, for securing the remaining entirety of the federal government's networks along with critical infrastructure, although in reality, each government agency has a major share of that responsibility. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, which is organized under the Department of Commerce, develops the mandatory standards and guidelines for federal agencies' information networks. DHS itself is also principally responsible for communicating and coordinating in the cyber arena with the private sector. But nowhere in the federal government is there any meaningful authority to regulate, police, or defend the private sector's cyber domain. Such authority as there is, is scattered across multiple ent entities. There are numerous, I think there are at least six federal cyber centers, and there are such disparate agencies as the Federal Trade Commission, which oversees uh, uh, private entities safeguarding consumer data against cyber breaches, to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates cyber activities for our national stock exchanges and, and regulated uh, broker-dealers, and let's not forget the Secret Service, which oversees cyber incidents as they affect the banking industry. I could go on, but you get the idea. Cyber responsibilities are scattered across the federal government. To be sure, there are understandable reasons why it evolved this way, and some good reasons for continuing a multifaceted approach, at least in part. With the multiplicities of agencies involved, it's no surprise that simply coordinating incident response is a major undertaking. PPD 41 lays out a framework that assigns responsibilities for federal cyber incidents to the FBI, DHS, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. But as you might expect, no one really thinks this is an optimal solution. And on Capitol Hill, while Congress has been active in holding many hearings on the topic, almost any member of Congress, uh, not to mention many outside commentators, would bemoan the fact that jurisdiction is dispersed among numerous committees and subcommittees leading some senators and congressmen within the past year to advocate for the adoption of a single committee overseeing cyber. My purpose in reviewing the nature of the cyber threat is not to, I should say, browbeat you about with the severity of the problem, but, uh, which I'm sure you accept, but instead to implore you to join me in the conviction that the time to act is now. The incessant and rapid pace of technological development in the cyber arena continues to outstrip our ability to organize ourselves to address cyber threats before they become cyber incidents. Some of the factors that have contributed to our slow or tepid response to the threat, ranging from, say, lack of awareness to an unrealistic hope that somehow a public-private partnership would miraculously evolve to solve the problem, have dissipated. We don't need to study or admire the problem any longer. So let's turn to what should be done. As I've already alluded to, there's been no dearth of strategies proposed to address the cyber threat on a national level. I won't go through them all. So you're probably familiar with ones from the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies, which produced a, a report advocating for uh, making, uh, creating an operational component within DHS to George Washington University's Center for Cyber and Homeland Security, uh, the Presidential Commission on Enhancing, Nibers, uh, Enhancing Cyber Security has also issued a report last year so there's been no question that a lot of attention has been paid to the nation's cybersecurity, but a consensus has not yet developed regarding the preferred approach. What's revealing, I would submit, however, is that virtually all of these studies seek to advance two overarching goals, one, integration, and two, agility. Any new approach to cybersecurity must be integrated in that it must include major national level structures in which all divisions of government know their <coughs> roles very clearly, there are non-duplicative assignments that are appropriate to the particular expertise and position of the government entity. Integration isn't merely a governmental imperative. A national coordinated solution, by definition, must involve both the public and private sectors, and equally must take full advantage of the intelligence insights uh, developed by our, uh, by our national security apparatus. 
Most importantly, it must coalesce around a real national will. Uh, the creation and sustaining of that should be the work of not only the executive and legislative brands, but also corporate America and academia. A new framework should also be agile. From my position at NSA, I've witnessed the challenges in sharing classified threat indicators within the government and across the private sector, and I've also seen firsthand that the process for determining who can act and what approach should be taken in response to a cyber threat is slow and cumbersome, involving formal requests for assistance, several layers of approval, and time-consuming fiscal considerations. It's akin to calling county water officials when your house is on fire who must ask for assistance from the fire department, who in turn receive approval from the mayor and money from the city treasury before a truck can roll. In the meantime, our cyber house has been reduced to cinders. It's essential that our cybersecurity framework be equipped with both the resources and authority to anticipate, protect against, and respond to cyber threats with all the speed that will make a difference. So how do we accomplish this? One obvious and affirmative strategy, and one that I think may have the most potential for achieving real gains, it would be to unify the government's cybersecurity activities by establishing a new lead department or agency for, for cyber. Easily said, perhaps, but exactly how would one go about doing so? Well, just as we did two centuries ago, I think we can look across the pond for ideas. The United Kingdom faces the same cyber threats we do, but for a variety of reasons one could speculate on, perhaps having to do with their size, institutional strengths, political culture, they're sometimes able to achieve solutions more quickly than our arguably more fractious democracy can. The UK within the past few months has selected a new integrated model by creating the National Security Cyber Center, or NCSC. Like the US, the UK had various entities, all with disparate responsibilities for cybersecurity. Their new center brought together four separate, uh, four separate entities. Their new center is designed to act as a bridge between industry and government providing a unified source of guidance, advice, and support on cybersecurity and management of cyber incidents. In other words, the NCSC model is intended to address both prevention and remediation of cyber threats and incidents by pulling together under one roof the entire range of cybersecurity functions. Now, I'm not necessarily proposing this model uh, for, the, for, for us. After all, the, U, the UK has a slightly different culture, a little bit different background, et cetera. But it's still useful, I submit, to look at the ground they've broken and see whether there's anything there that we can import as any good ideas. The UK carefully considered, one issue they carefully considered was whether to put the NCSC inside the intelligence community or outside the intelligence community in their case. <clears throat> Much like in the US, there was apprehension in the UK after the Snowden disclosures about the role of intelligence apparatus. Ultimately, however, the UK decided to stand up the NCSC as an agency wholly within the government communications headquarters, which is their analog to my agency, the NSA, in other words, within the intelligence community. This was done, in their case, because exactly the same with NSA, there was a perception that GCHQ had within it the technical expertise and intelligence insights that would be needed by the new organization. Now, in order to overcome the public's apprehension about this uh, decision, the NCSC committed itself to an unprecedented level of transparency. It publishes comprehensive data on cyber threats and wherever possible includes the underlying supporting evidence. Its facility, the actual building itself, is unclassified. It's open to the public uh, so, that, so that they can bring in subject matter experts and, have, and technical experts and have them uh, uh, educate the uh, NCSC personnel about their own industries. In conjunction with the establishment of the NCSC, the UK also rolled out its national cyber security strategy, which sets out on a countrywide basis the entire approach for tackling and managing cyber threats to the country. Overall, the UK has committed over $2 billion over the next five years to address the cybersecurity threat on a national level. Naturally, there are drawbacks to such a model. Uh, for example, concentrating cybersecurity responsibilities in one lead agency admittedly uh, misses an opportunity uh, to marry cyber expertise with the unique insights of each particular agency. Uh, and in addition, as we've seen with our own Department of Homeland Security, standing up a new organization is fraught with political and bureaucratic difficulties. But on balance, the UK decided that the potential advantages of setting up a new agency uh, seemed to outweigh the disadvantages. So could we do the same thing here? At least on its face, this would satisfy the two principles I suggested earlier, namely integration and agility. 
More importantly, through unification, the cyber protection mission would be informed by the foreign intelligence mission that uncovers malicious cyber activity from nation states and political groups adverse to us. If we were to follow the UK model, cybersecurity would be the principal mission for a newly created organization rather than a secondary or tertiary support function as it now is for many federal agencies. And it just stands to reason that would yield better outcomes. Unifying cybersecurity responsibilities in one organization would enable the federal government to eliminate redundancies and to concentrate and streamline cybersecurity resources and expertise, both of which can be hard to come by in an era when the cost of purchasing and updating equipment and retaining cyber talent creates challenges to the implementation of cyber best practices. And manifestly, housing the cyber threat discovery, protection, defense, and remediation capabilities in one entity would afford, by definition, the agility and timeliness that is critical to an effective cyber strategy. In short, I think the case for such a unified central approach is fairly compelling. Even if we all agreed that such an approach was the right one, there would still be many, many details to be worked out. One key question would be how to sufficiently empower the new organization so that it could effectively defend the various networks of, of many federal entities, which would include the power, for example, in some sense to police those networks, to set and enforce standards, perhaps even shutting them down if needed in the event of a cyber threat, all at the same time while letting each entity have its own necessary authority and responsibility. A unified and nationally prioritized budgetary approach would clearly be a critical component of this, of this effort. And similarly, Congress would need to embrace this approach on many levels, including centralizing to some extent the jurisdiction over cyber matters that, as I mentioned, is now dispersed among many committees. If this nationally unified approach were adopted, I'm not necessarily proposing that this be housed within NSA, although that's certainly worth exploring. We recognize that, admittedly, there are very real concerns about the scope of government surveillance. We also understand there are concerns about zero-day vulnerabilities or cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, that could be discovered by the government. But at a minimum, I would submit, NSA must at least have a special relationship with any such new cybersecurity organization. It simply would make no sense, in my opinion, to deny the new organization the insights and warnings about cyber threats that are developed by NSA through its foreign intelligence mission. <laughs> that would just really fly in the face of the very need for integration and agility. Now, whether that relationship takes the form of some deeper partnership, say, between NSA and a new truly integrated cyber center in perhaps a cabinet level department of cyber or housed within the existing Department of Homeland Security, well, that's something that the executive branch and the legislative branches will have to sort out. And finally, <clears throat> I want to make clear that by advocating that we avail ourselves of the infrastructure already paid for with taxpayer dollars and of the expertise and position of NSA, I'm not, however, suggesting increased surveillance authorities for NSA. We recognize that while increased communications monitoring may well be a byproduct, inevitable byproduct of confronting the cyber threat, it's equally true that monitoring and implementing other technological approaches are clearly fraught with understandable concern about government intrusion. Undoubtedly, there are portions of the population with unanswered questions, or perhaps worse, about us, but just because that perception exists doesn't mean that folks like me are doomed to silence. Instead, I, I honestly feel we owe it to ourselves and to the public to enter the debate on topics like cybersecurity. The cybersecurity threat is grave. We've got the unique expertise needed to help safeguard the nation against these threats. It's important to share some of our knowledge developed over many years in order to foster a vital public debate about the right way to address threats to our national security. And part of that debate has to involve an honest discussion about the pros and cons of locating a lead cyber agency or department within the intelligence community. We at NSA feel duty bound to address these types of issues and we'd like to do so transparently and openly as to develop the consensus on the best approach. I hope I've done that here today. And thank you for listening this morning and since I just spoke so highly about fostering discussion, I'd like to, Charlie, if it's okay, open it up to questions, so thank you. I'm going to take the executive director's privilege here and, and ask actually two questions, one, one a short one. Uh, you know, NSA is in theory part of the Department of Defense. Very much so. And uh, would it be prudent giving, if, if NSA got a, got a larger charter, 
Would it be prudent to have it as an independent, all civilian agency? That would be, one, would that be one of the things that we ought to look at? And then secondly, uh, get, getting back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, if you could share some thoughts, especially for the law students, about your career path and how you go from 40 years in the civilian sector into, into government and, and how much fun that was, especially uh, um, filling out financial disclosures and, and security clearances and so forth. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, two, two good questions. I like the second better than the first. Uh, <laughs> But I will, I will touch on the first. So obviously what I'm about to say on the first one is, as you would expect, my personal opinion. Um, but uh, the, the, after 9-11, after as you all know, the, there was a 9-11 commission that looked at how we needed to address um, our intelligence community and eliminate stovepipes. This is all well known to you. And part of that involved setting up the, uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and making sure that NSA was part of that, even though it remains within the Department of Defense and is clearly as a combat support agency. Uh, indeed, so much so that a part of NSA is co-located with the United States Cyber Command, which is the offensive side of the cyber operation. So um, there clearly is a very strong military mission for NSA. It is a combat support agency. Uh, we, we daily deal with uh, uh, assisting our troops around the world in um, in Afghanistan, elsewhere, et cetera, where and, and all around the world, including uh, the Navy in the Pacific, et cetera. So, so uh, I don't I don't easily see a way of separating out the combat support function because the signals intelligence uh, capability is very relevant to that. So my personal view is I don't see how it would be easily possible to separate that out from a military mission, whether it's housed in the Department of Defense or or purely within ODNI and whether it reports to one another is a question beyond beyond me because it's just a governmental political question. I don't I don't personally have any opinion on it. I I do I do, I would, however, like to say that um, from my perspective, having come there as an outsider, uh, uh, I don't see some of the tension that I read about in news articles about this about oh it's it, it should be here it should be there whatever there's tension. I, I personally on the inside. I find there's tremendous amount of teamwork. I'm not just saying it. I mean, as I said, I come here with no axe to grind. I find there's a tremendous amount of teamwork, tremendous amount of coordination. And yes, it's true that there are sort of two bosses, so to speak, ODNI and I and the Secretary of Defense. But I see a tremendous amount of coordination and a tremendous amount of synergies and positive uh, collaboration that comes out of it. Uh, does that mean there aren't differences of opinion and different issues about turf? Yeah, of course, that's true in any government entity. But I, my own personal view is that I, I, I don't see the need to change things right now. Uh, as we move to setting up a new cyber agency, if that happens, if people like some of the ideas I was talking about, you could see some change. Anyway, on to the second point. I, I'll be quicker. Um, uh, I, I served for 40 years at a law firm, and every point in my law firm career, uh, I, I decided I would stay there for two more years, and I just kept, <laughs> when I joined, when I joined my law firm, my wife said, how long are you going to be at this Wall Street law firm? I said, oh, probably two years, and I'll go do something interesting. And then after two years, I sort of said, well, it wasn't that bad, I'll wait another two, and the next thing I know, I got sent to Singapore, and then I said, well, I'll wait a year or two, and then I got sent to Hong Kong, and then next thing I know, I went to Washington, none of which was planned, all due to clerical error. Um, and uh, I checked the wrong box somewhere. And uh, to make a long story short, I wound up spending 40 years, which is a fabulous career, and I often thought of going into public service, and only as I was approaching retirement did I decide that I wanted to retire two years early. We had a mandatory retirement age of 65. I was then 63, and I started looking around for a public service job, simple as that. Um, it took me a while to find one. This one, this particular one, wasn't one that I was seeking. All the ones I was seeking, I was told I wasn't qualified for. And this one, they told me, you're really not qualified for this one. Um, but uh, uh, I, I did it anyway, and it was, and it's just been a fascinating opportunity. And, and for those of you law students in the, um, in the audience, I would just simply say that uh, one career path is to join the government and then go into the private sector, and there are synergies and benefits to both, and you can go back and forth, and there are many people who've had a terrific career doing that. I also think it's perfectly fine to uh, spend a career in the public, in the private sector. Um, certainly, God knows it's more financially rewarding, um, and it, it gives you the feeling of comfort that you can go into public service. I, I now feel I'm doing this purely not because I need the job, but because I genuinely want to do public service, as maybe as corny as that may sound. And uh, I think, I think so, not, you wouldn't want everyone doing this, but I think a fresh pair of eyes in government uh, is, a, is a helpful thing, not that it's, that's the only thing. 
When you talk about the new agency, um, I hear a lot of different functions, some of which, as you mentioned, there's Cybercom, which is responsible maybe for some of the offensive cyber actions, and then there's, the NSA has a lot of the data that they would need. Um, do, you, do you envision an agency uh, that has like a, a similar bifurcated authority like the Coast Guard with a lot of law enforcement function and responsibility, uh, and then linked to that, Cybercom's maybe more military style, or having <laughs> themselves maybe an opportunity to become part of the military? Yeah. Uh, good question. So my own sense is that uh, U.S. Cybercom probably needs to remain as a separate entity. It has a, clearly an offensive mission. Admittedly, it uses some of the infrastructure that NSA has. It wouldn't make sense for the government <clears throat> to, having spent billions of dollars over the years on NSA, to then replicate all that infrastructure and et cetera uh, for Cybercom. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I see a clear line between offense and defense, so to speak. I, I don't really like using those words, but they're sort of labels and they're not exactly accurate, but I'll, for this purpose, I'll just use it if you'll indulge me. Um, so clearly there's a very defined mission for US Cybercom, and I think that needs to remain separate. It does need to use the infrastructure of NSA, so I think the two organizations will always be in some way coordinated, uh, at, at, if not actually co-located, but at least coordinated in some important way. Um, and it certainly gets information from NSA in terms of uh, uh, information about the cyber landscape. So clearly that intelligence information needs to flow over. So there will always be a close partnership. Uh, whether, uh, I don't necessarily envision, you mentioned law enforcement, I don't necessarily envision a law enforcement function for this new cyber entity, and I think that would complicate its mission. And I note in particular that the UK, I didn't go into too many details about the UK, the UK expressly decided that its new cybersecurity center would not be a regulator. And the reason they did that, and I think this is important, is they wanted to encourage the private industry to come in and feel comfortable sitting down and talking to someone without the feeling that, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell us more about that. We might be interested in taking you to court on that point. And that's, that, I think, is one of the reasons there's been some hesitancy on the part of the private sector to fully share and collaborate with the FBI in some cyber areas, although the FBI does a fabulous job, because there's an understandable reluctance. Well, gee, if I let them in here to see my computers and try to fix it, who knows what else they'll discover? And will they also call the SEC and tell them about this? And you know, et cetera. So I get that feeling, and I, I, I think it's important to, to just recognize the reality of that. Yes. Sure. Absolutely agree that, that there is. Um, an insufficient level of synchronized action and planning for response. Um, sorry, I'm the, the staff judge advocate for U.S. Cyber Command, so Glenn and I work pretty closely all the time. Um, I, I agree with everything you said. Right. Thank you. Um, I do. There, there is a challenge here, um, among many, obviously, but. Uh, one, it, while Cyber Command does have the offensive mission, I think this whatever structure we put in place has to also recognize that of the national security systems, the largest is the DOD information network, um, which is part of our mission to secure that network. So that's a defensive mission uh, for the department and critical because overall we view the, the, the DODIN, as we call it, the, dif the information network, as as an operating platform uh, for the for the department, so we'd have to account for that. But also, I think, um, like if you look at PPD forty one, uh, it's definitely built on a traditional consequence management construct, which is primarily focused on natural disasters, and it's right. So it's threat or actor agnostic, right. which I think is a flaw. That's part of the problem in cyber is you can't as easily and neatly separate the two. And I think we're getting to a point where we have to face the question of um, it's not just a matter of sec securing, which also involves primarily your, your remediation and recovery uh, functions of your networks, but also dealing with the problem proactively forward. So, you know, I, th there'd be a challenge still, I think, of 
fully synchronizing and integrating all those functions. Um, so I just thoughts on that. Yeah, no, you raise a very good point. One I wish I would could have spent more time on in my comments, but uh, Gary's point is uh, is an excellent one. Um, there, the clearly there needs to be close coordination between if if one were to adopt this unified approach that I mentioned and house all these responsibilities of of incident management and remediation and threat prevention, et cetera, in one entity. Uh, clearly would have to have a close coordination with U.S. Cybercom, and I think, I think, as you said correctly, PPD-41 was, was developed, it grew out of incident response to, you know, Hurricane Katrina and whatnot, and, and so it was that sort of mindset of how do we, how do we as, ourselves organize our, our, ourselves as a nation to deal with a natural catastrophe, and that's instructive and informative, but as Gary said, in the world of cyber, it's not quite exactly analogous, and so I think we, as I said, I don't think anyone feels that the that 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 directive is the be all and end all. Um, interestingly, the uh, some of, we don't have time to spend on it, but just a note: the the GWU George Washington University Cyber uh, Center report that I alluded to um, provided uh, had a rather provocative idea regarded by some, which is that um, certain private sector entities that sort of passed a test and met a level of sophistication should be allowed to I'll use the vernacular hack back. So if they were attacked they could do something about it to the bad guy, whoever the bad guy was. That raises a host of problems. How do you do attribution? How do they know they're right? What if, uh, you know, in fact, um, uh, just one last comment. Uh, Penny Pritzker was quoted last year by saying that even though cyber is very, very, and the internet is completely ubiquitous in our lives, uh, it's the only domain where we as a nation and government um, uh, allow Russia, China, other countries to sit back and attack our private sector entities and we don't do anything about it. This, is, this was her quote, I probably don't have it exactly right, but that was the essence of it. And, uh, and, and it's for good reason. I mean, we, 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 don't, we, don't, uh, we don't want necessarily private sector entities responding directly. It's probably a, clearly a governmental function because of the problems of attribution, the political ramifications, and so on and so forth. But it's, a, it's an area fraught with difficulty. Amy, do you have a question? I have to ask it now because we're running out of time. <clears throat> I, I'm a citizen. <laughs> That's my role here. I am interested in what you think that the federal government's role is in securing the um, electrical grid and the local water supplies, and how can, how can the federal government help with those things? So uh, you're, I'm assuming you're referring to the cyber aspect of it, so I'll comment on that. So um, uh, one of the problems in, in protecting in critical infrastructure in the United States generally is that a very, very substantial, indeed the majority of critical infrastructure, the DHS has allocated this to a number of sectors that they specifically define, is in the hands of either, is in the hands of the private sector, number one, think of just uh, uh, chemical facilities, electric companies, water projects, et cetera, and, and uh, the, a big chunk of the rest is in the hands of municipalities, water, et cetera, and then only a very small part is actually held or under the control of the federal government. So for DHS to, op, quote, operate on infrastructure directly uh, is very difficult. And we saw in the election lots of discussions about um, uh, electoral systems in each state being a function of a, the secretary of each state as well as in each municipality or county. So it's not something that the federal government can deal with. You mentioned in particular water and electric. Um, I think those two utilities, based on my own, own experience previously with a, a DHS advisory committee, the, the electricity sector is way out ahead, probably equal to the financial sector in terms of the level of its sophistication uh, in the cybersecurity area. Uh, I think the, the consequences of a cyber attack on the grid, so to speak, uh, taking it down are very well understood and documented and a great deal of work has been done. And that sector in particular coordinates very closely with DHS. And I would say I think most people give that level of cooperation in that sector, uh, you know, pretty much a, a, a grade A, uh, maybe not A plus, but certainly a grade A. And I, I think the federal government is doing the right thing and the sector is well organized. But that's in part because the sector is, is 
pretty small, relatively limited number of operators in the electrical world, and they're pretty homogenous. They all sort of look the same, not totally, but, but more so than elsewhere. Um, water, by contrast, um, is more difficult. It's dispersed. There are public owners and private owners. It's inher inherently municipal and very, very local. It's obviously dispersed across the country. There's no one water organization. They're all different. They have, I mean, some get water from wells versus rivers versus oceans, desalinate them. They're just all whole different technology, whole different systems. And I would say uh, the good news is there, there is a relatively a smaller portion of their operational business that's affected by cyber, but there's some. Uh, so that's the good news, although maybe they're arguably less vulnerable, but on the other hand, it's really hard to coordinate and collaborate in that agency, and uh, that air sector, and I think um, you'd probably say that they lag behind, uh, they lag behind, I'm not blaming the industry, I'm, I'm just saying that inherently it's, it's just difficult for both sides, the government, to assist uh, because the federal government has limited abilities, et cetera. So, um, good question. So I thought that it was very interesting about the UK and all of that that you spoke about. Um, this is more of a structural question. So we always talk about either developing a whole new group of people to do a project, and I'm a citizen too. I have no, I'm not a cyber NSA. I've never had a clearance in my life. So I may be asking this really in a bad way, but <laughs> so. Um, is there a way that you have an in plan, which is your structure? I would like to have this organization. And then do you backtrack it more structurally, like if we get these laws passed or we move this section to this section? So you start building blocks that actually is not sweeping but takes four or five years to actually accomplish where you're trying to go. That's my first question. Second one's an easy question, if you can tell me. What's a percentage of military to civilian in the NSA? Um. I, sh I should know the latter, and I'm afraid I'm, uh, it, I mean, it, it's public, there's nothing, nothing secret about it, uh, but I, I don't know the percentage, but it, it's, um, maybe Gary knows, I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's, there is a significant uh, active duty component in the, in, the, in there. Do you, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, <laughs> you should, you should, absolutely, it's, I, you know? I don't know the exact I'm, 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 I'm guessing, I'm, gu I'm guessing it's, you know, it's certainly in excess of 10%, but it's not, it's not a secret. I mean, it's, it, 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 NSA very much, uh, it's half, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, as I said, I don't know the percentage, but it's, it's very, it's substantial is what I would say, certainly substantial. Um, your first question, thank you for the help, the audience help. Uh, I, I need all the help I can get. Uh, on, the, on the question of how to, how to structure this, well, look, that's a, got, clearly got to be a national debate. I mean, Congress will be doing it, whatever the it is, the decision, but, that, but Congress doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's affected by what the, legislative, but what the executive branch wants and what the public wants. And um, so we have to have, as I said, a national debate on this. I think you probably start uh, not necessarily with the legal end of saying what laws need to be changed, although that clearly is a factor. And I think you start with the organizational decision and say, if we were to house this in one entity, which is a big if, I recognize that, but if we were, um, what would that look like? What, what would be its scope? I, I suggested in response to earlier questions that it wouldn't, for example, deal with offense, and it wouldn't deal with enforcement. Well, you know, that's just my opinion, so someone else could have a different view. Uh, so I think you need to figure out what, what you want it to look like, where, where you want it housed, and then figure out what laws need to be changed. Um, I, I would, while I think that's probably a multi-year dialogue, given, given the nature of how things move through Congress, um, I, I would think that you'd want to do it as one integrated step rather than take a baby step, see if it works, and then change a the law and whatever, because I think you'll, you won't know it works until you've got it set up. So I think it, it needs to be a, a, a completed idea and then, and then adopt that completed idea, whatever that is. Glenn, thank you so okay, much. Well, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the next 14 minutes, and please be back here at uh, 929.